Welcome to the HR Stories Podcast, listener question edition, where there is a lesson in every story. Each week, the team at HR Stories Podcast shares questions from our podcast audience and provides tangible, practical advice that everyone can use to get HR right. Our hosts today are management and HR consultants, Chuck Simikian and John Tallheimer. What is on your mind today? Welcome, listeners, to our question and answer segment. What is on your mind today is a question we want to know. We get all the time, we get listener questions, we get questions from our our Facebook group. Sometimes we will get questions when we're doing our seminars around HR with our managers and our supervisors. We get a lot. People will come up to us because they know we're in this business and say, hey, I have this situation. I'm an employee, but I want to hear your take on this. Um, And so we are doing our podcast is the employee edition. We're doing two segments on the employee edition. So if you haven't tuned into episode uh, 46, uh, make sure that you do that. Um, 46 and 47 will both be employee rights episodes. So definitely check those out. All right, Chuck, what's in the mailbag today? Open the mailbag. Tell me. Yeah. What Open in the mailbag. So normally, John, we've been doing two or three questions during this segment, but we've had a lot of participation from, from listeners and people asking different things. We've got five questions today, five questions wow. that the team at HR stories is ready to answer, ready to jump on, <laughs> give our opinions and our thoughts on these matters. So the first question is one where uh, the person says, we have a full-time employee that has not been working his hourly requirement of 32 hours per week. If the managers do not have enough work for him, is there anything you suggest? It's a good question, right? I don't know, Chuck. We probably run into this a lot, especially Um, when we are working as HR professionals, managers may come to us with this question as I have an employee, I don't have enough work for him, um, to get him up to his 32 hour requirements. What should I be doing? Um, we do know that companies will set a full-time hourly, full-time hour status at maybe 30 hours, maybe 32, maybe 36, maybe 40, um, And if an employee doesn't meet that, that means they're part time and they maybe not get the benefits and stuff. And so now we have this employee that's kind of going back and forth between those two lines. How should what what should I be doing? And so my advice for this and when we're thinking about it is if I have an employee and I, a manager, don't have work for them. Is there other people in the organization that can use that person's talents? Um, right. and so that would be my first thing. Is there other things we need to do? That kind of stuff. Um, I also would have a conversation with the employee going, look, um, work is slowing down right now. Is there anything else that you're interested in learning? Is there anything else you want to be a part of? Um, and maybe let them shadow people for a little bit, right? That's not going to be a long-term solution, but that could kind of get, oh, you know, I'm really interested in this department. Could I spend some time there as well? The employee may be very happy that their hours are slowing down, right? And so again, having that conversation. I don't know. What do you think, Chuck? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, this is not so much a legal question as it is just an employee relations and a cultural question. When you look at this, uh, we have a full-time employee that has not been working his 32 hours. It's not the employee's decision, apparently, that they're not working the 32 hours. So it's not any type of, we need to get involved and tell this employee they need to work more hours. It's, hey, they want to work. We want them to work. They're available. We just don't have the hours. The other thing is there's no legal requirement outside of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act threshold of uh, 30 hours or more averaging per week equals a full-time employee. But other than that, there's no requirement that you have to give this burden a um, certain amount of hours. But from an employee relations and a cultural standpoint, yes, all the things you suggest are great. Uh, don't ignore the situation. Don't pretend. Sit down, talk to the person, say, this is what is going on. 
Uh, they may say, look, I'll tell you what, if you're only going to get 30 hours a week or uh, or something like that, how about you give it to me in three 10-hour segments and then I can go out and get a part-time job, or another job, or I don't want to leave this job. What are the chances of me? You know, you're right. Sometimes employees are okay with it, but the the dialogue, and it's something that you uh, personally stress throughout all of our episodes and all of our conversations is dialogue and communication two way talk to your people. Yeah. And so, yeah, I agree with all of your assessment on this. Yeah, no, only, the other thing that I would kind of add in there is go look at your policies. What does your policy say? So if you have a very clear policy that says uh, to be an, to be considered full time, you must consistently make 32 hours per week over a 15 week period or over a 30 week period, and this person's not doing it, then you may need to have a harder conversation, even though you want them to work. If you don't have the work, you may need to move them to that part-time role. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. To be consistent with your policies. So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, the policy, that's true. Make sure you're in line with that. So question two, that's the potty mouth question of the day. (laughs) I know of a department in my company that has very loud cursing all day long. They use the F-bomb as if it was candy, but no one complains. Do we not consider this a hostile work environment since no one has complained, though? Yeah. Oh, gosh. All right, so let me think about this. I want to. I want to say something very bright here. Um, right. I, I'm bright. I I want you to be careful, right? Because cursing, you know, dropping the f bomb, saying some few words, probably is not going to raise it up to uh, legal hostile work environment. However, there should be a level of professionalism that is set within your organization. And just because this one department think it's completely acceptable, other people who may be interacting with that department may not. Let me give you an example. So I worked at a company called QVC. And I did many different things there, had many different responsibilities. One of them, at one time, I oversaw the culinary on-air team. So these were the individuals that made, uh, were the food stylists that made all the foods that were being shown on air. That was their job. And most of the people we hired came out of the restaurant business. And if you've ever worked as a sous chef or in the back kitchen of a restaurant, even as a wait staff as a restaurant, you know the environment can be very volatile and things, people are saying things and yelling things and it can be loud and cursing and all that kind of stuff. And so some of those habits carried in to our work environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but here we are, this big professional retail company, we had to stop it right away, right? We, as soon as it started, we were going back there and going, you cannot act this way. You continue to act this way. You're going to be let go. Um, And in fact, we had to let one person go because um, they would direct their anger and annoyance, not only at kitchen staff, but also at host and on air guests and producers and product people. Right. And so it was completely unacceptable. And so I don't to me, if I had this happening in my workplace, I'm addressing it. I want it to be professional. This is the standard we have. Um, I don't want to ever get it to that place where it's going to be considered severe and pervasive. Yeah, absolutely. And just if I could add the term hostile work environment, it might be a bullying environment. It might be an unprofessional environment and it might be hostile to a certain point, but it does, it may not reach to the legal standard of what the EEOC considers a hostile work environment, unless there is more uh, than just the the outburst of F this and F that and F this. So, um, yeah, if it starts going a little further, it could become that hostile work. And it's also so who good. it's directed at or directed yes. towards and right, all of that goes into play. 
I here's the thing, right? You don't want to have to find out in court whether you were right or not. Right? We don't want to have that expense. So always address it right away. All right. What other kind great of questions point. we have, Chuck? We're on a roll. Yeah, today. that's a great Feeling perspective. Good. So this is a bit of a sticky situation, so to speak. And, okay. uh, and, you know, we've said so many times text messages can get people in trouble. Right. So this listener has a male employee that sent a female coworker employee an inappropriate Snapchat over the weekend at 3 a.m. saying something along the lines of, and in quotes, Show me your boobs. <clears throat> wait, wait. Yeah. So let me get this right. 3 a.m. A, was it a male coworker? Yes. Okay. So a male coworker sends a text message or Snapchat to a female coworker Saturday night, 3 a.m. Obviously, they were not working. Um, okay. I'm just setting up the scenario. Yeah. What's the she, question? She gets a message 3 a.m. Show me your boobs. So then the, the male employee sends her another message the next day uh, saying, oh my, this was a mistake. He had meant to send the message to someone else. Okay. Now, the female employee talked to her manager and another employee about it, but it, it did get around the office a bit before it came to the HR person. And the HR person did speak with the female employee and the employee said she did not want to file a complaint against her coworker. She showed the Snapchat thread, but the original message had already been deleted. And all that the HR folks saw was the apology message. So the question on the table here is there any other action needs to be done? Is there so, any other action that needs so to be done? So she's talked to the, so she heard this through the grapevine, right? She heard this, blah, 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 blah. I better go. So she talked to the female worker and said, hey, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a complaint do you want to do? Are you okay? What's going on? Check them out, made sure they were all right. The female employee's like, I'm fine. I think it was a mistake. I'm not worried about it. It's not going to influence my working environment with this person. I'm fine. Right. That was the thing. Yes, okay. that's exactly what you hear. Yes. Okay. So is there anything else we need to do from an HR point of view? I do think that I would definitely document my conversation, right? Document, Absolutely. document, document. I also think I would probably have a conversation, although it will be embarrassing for both of us, with the male employee as well. <laughs> yeah. And explaining to him how that could be offensive and and I would pull up our policy of work conduct and I would say, look, this is why blah blah blah. We I understand that you did it accidentally, or at least you're saying that. But right, and then I would also document that conversation and hopefully that would be the end of it. But here's the thing, right? Now you have it going around and doing it and dealing with it in the workplace. Um, and there's not much you can do. You could, depending on the company, you could move up your sexual harassment training. Um, you know, right? Kind of it kind of just maybe influence that. Or if you're not doing sexual harassment training, maybe do sexual harassment training, which just as a plug, Chuck does this fantastically. Um, and so Maybe that's it. I don't know. What do you think, Chuck? You're the yeah. sexual harassment expert. Yeah, I would say that uh, a one-time thing, an accidental thing, you know, if this man, this male employee had never done this before, uh, you're right. Document it. You need to document it and document it with the female employee to say, okay, I'm documenting that. Nothing, you know, you, you require no other action. We're good. We're all good here. Boom, boom, boom. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Because if things happen again, if this person happens to be a cereal, uh, and I don't mean like your breakfast cereal. I'm talking about like a constant <laughs> repeat offender right, of, yeah. oh, I accidentally did that. Oh, I accidentally brushed up against her. Oh, I accidentally said. Then it's like, okay, we're seeing patterns. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're gonna document. I think you got. The, I think you nailed it, John. You nailed. You nailed that answer. Wow, 
That's that's high praise coming from you. Yeah. Show me your answer. Show me your answer. <laughs> I want to see the math exactly. on that. <laughs> there you did. You did great. All right. We do have a couple more questions, John, that I, right. I wanted to, to dive in here. Well, we're pushing the limit now. You know, Samantha's going to be a little, you know, getting a little upset with us because we're pushing the time limit. I think we're good, but let's just keep yeah. going. Question four, 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 four. If you have an employee okay. who reports harassment, uh, how, how do you follow up with them when you investigate and find that they too may have harassed others or at least engaged in less than ideal behavior without falling into, and this was a re real nice twist on this question, without falling into retaliation. What do you think, right. John? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, let's go to that retaliation point, right? We do not want, as HR professionals, we do not want to get into that situation where people feel like we're retaliating against them because they brought a sexual harassment complaint. We know, I think statistically, 75% of those individuals who come forward with a complaint um, are retaliated against, right? Typically, it's not HR. I'm not saying HR does that. It's their managers or the coworkers that are uh, being accused of it. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not doing that. But if it's a legitimate complaint, and I, I want to hear your point of view on this, Chuck. Mine is, if it's a legitimate complaint, then you now have two investigations that you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. So, Aaron, what, what do you think? Yeah, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have another investigation uh, going and happening concurrently, and you leave no stone unturned. You're not gonna come up against retaliation if you are doing in good faith, following a lead. Okay, if you're following a lead during your questioning and and something comes up, that's okay. Um, where you get in 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 problems is where if the employee uh that was maybe the the perpetrator and they start making things up and they are now lying most sexual harassment policies these days hint hint folks if you don't have yeah. it in your policy you may want to it says that any any unfounded claims uh on sexual harassment can lead to disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment. And I've seen that over the last year or two in some policies. So you've got to follow it through. You cannot be afraid of retaliation. It's legit, good faith effort, move forward. So I think once again, bing, you hit the nail <laughs> on the head. I would say to everyone that's listening, if you have to do sexual harassment investigations, get the book, The Ultimate Book of HR Checklists. There is a great um, checklist, uh, actually a couple checklists, for you to use um, to do those harassment investigations. Um, Chuck built it. So little, let's give a kudos to Chuck. Chuck built it based on his years of experience in having to deal with this in the workplace. And so he really goes through it and it's very clear and detailed on what you need to do as an employer. One of the big thing Chuck stresses in it is documentation, documentation, documentation. So definitely go check that out. If you're interested in getting, go to the team at hrstories.com. Uh, it's on our resource page or our product page. I think it's on our product page. Uh, so definitely mm -hmm. go check that out. All right. We have one more question, Chuck. I'm waiting. What is it? Yeah. So this is the bonus round. Question five, five. Bonus we round. Bonus round, when you feel that you're being targeted and treated unfairly at work and you are the HR person, right? But you are the only one in HR, you're a team of one in HR and you feel you're being treated unfairly at work, where do you go? And and I, I do have some additional information for this that might help this this yeah. questioner, this listener, uh, and this is actually from the team, uh, HR team of one community, uh, our Facebook page. This person said, the company owner 
has commented to her that she is not professional now that she's become a mother. I'm not professional now, now that you've become a mother and has started requiring me to send him half hourly schedule for each day and a summary of everything I did each day at the end of the day. Yeah, and so think? refresh my memory. Is she a remote worker? I think she was a remote worker. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. I know yeah, she's employed in D.C., Washington, yeah, D.C. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and so when I hear that there's been a change of direction from the supervisor because the person is now a mother. So she's recently had a child is what I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, and now this person, the supervisor is getting on their case and asking them to do specific things. Um, I get, I get this gut feeling, Chuck. I get a little nervous that we may be going into pregnancy discrimination lawsuit um, right. or sexual harassment, sexual uh, harassment lawsuit. Um, so what do we do? What, what do I do? I am the department of one. So I have no HR person to go to. This person's the owner or CEO of the company. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question, is there somebody over them? Is there a group of board of directors? Is there a chairman of the board, right? So I'm trying to think about that. What else, what advice would you give, Chuck? Yeah, well, that's really all you can do at this point. You know, who, who if it's a business owner and it's a sole business owner, there's not much more, you know, unless you believe, truly believe in your heart that it is uh, uh, an EEOC violation that they are treating you differently because a, maybe gender female, B, because of uh, pregnancy or the fact that you are uh, a parent and, and you're able to show I'm being treated differently than anyone else that reports to this owner, you may have a case at May. which point you could either A, stick it out and try and steer them or B, you leave the company uh, and C, you could do either of these things, but you could contact the EEOC and file a complaint saying, I'm not going to leave my job, but I, I need some help. Um, yeah. I, I, and here's the thing. And I, and I think this is the advice I gave on the webpage is to me, it sounds like this person is unhappy. The CEO is unhappy with the HR's first performance. And I think some of the things this person was saying was, well, I don't like, I'm more, I'm focused on this and that kind of stuff. And so always, and this is really for employees and as HR professionals, we are employees, employees and HR professionals and managers. If the employee is not doing what you want, asking them to give you a half an hour progress report is silly. Right. That's mm -hmm. micromanaging. Right. That you're treating them like they're in high school or they're their kids. And if that's the only way. I'm, and so I would ask this HR professional to sit down with the CEO and ask this question. Where do you want me to focus my time? Yeah. Here's all the things I'm working on. Right. And do it in a way that's not going to be upsetting. Right. And so I'm probably not clearly doing that. But I, I, I would ask, like, what do you want me to, where do you want me to put my focus on? Because I may be focusing on something that I think is really important for the company and their focus is on, and I think the example she gave, now this may be, I may be getting my questions mixed up, but the example she gave was the CEO said to her, um, why isn't, uh, how, why haven't, why is Patty complaining to me that her paycheck isn't right? And so to me, what the hidden message there is, why do I, as the CEO, have to deal with this silly thing? You should yeah. be dealing with it. That's why we hired you, right? And so having that clear conversation with the CEO about where your focus should be, because honestly, 
if I was that HR proponent and I was focused on a HR sexual harassment claim in my organization, I may have let Patty's paycheck go off a little bit. Not that long, but I may. Right. And so I think that's where I would start. That would be my advice there. I don't I don't know, yeah. Chuck, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I think you're 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 spot on. The, the, but what I missed in some of this was have you talked to your boss? Have you laid out your case and just gone to them? So that's who you talk to. You talk to them first and right. you say, look, here's the deal. And this could be, uh, I'm uncomfortable with it. It could be discrimination. It could be. So I think you talk to them first. But at the end of the day, you have to be happy. So you need to decide, are you going to stay? And I know there were a lot of comments on our Facebook page on this one. Some more people are saying, stay and fight. Others were saying, get your resume together. So it right. was a really good uh, generator of conversation. Yeah, and I love that on the Facebook page page that there's so much wisdom and people will share like, oh, I was in that situation. Here's what I did. And I don't know if this is the best way, but this is what I would have done. And so then that person can take all that wisdom and then choose how they're going to act going forward. Chuck and I will jump in there too, if we think it's necessary. Um, so we love having you guys on there. So keep that up, keep going in there as well. Uh, we have some great people participating up there. Yeah. All right, folks, you've been listening to the Q&A segment, the question and answer segment of the HR Stories podcast, where there's a listen in every story and at times we have some answers too. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening to the HR Stories podcast. The material presented in this podcast is for informational purposes only. Chuck and John always recommend using an employment lawyer or HR consultant to handle any legal concerns or HR issues. We do our best to double check sources and make sure the information we are providing is accurate. We may eliminate or embellish without changing the basic narrative to make the story easier to understand. In certain circumstances, we may change identifying information to protect the innocent. The HR Stories broadcast is brought to you by the team at HR Stories. The team at HR Stories is designed to help anyone with HR responsibilities be better at managing the employee experience. To engage with us, Go to the HRStoriesTeam.com and learn more about how the team at HR Stories can support your business or nonprofit. Thank you for listening to the HR Stories podcast, where there is a lesson in every story. <laughs>